Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing very well. So I just watched What If Episode 2. Let's talk about it. So we're just going to be diving straight into my thoughts on Episode 2 of What If. As per usual, if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to my channel and make sure you turn on your notifications so that you can be told when I upload next. Now, without further ado, let's get into my thoughts on this episode because there is just so much to get through. So first of all, I just love it when I'm right. I just love it when I... Don't you love it when I'm right? <laughs> Like, don't you guys love it when I am right? Because what did I tell you last week? What did I say about episode one of What If? I said, okay, just to remind you guys, you may have forgotten, that one of the issues that that episode had was its pacing. It felt so rushed. It felt like they were trying to cram in the entirety of Captain America, the first Avenger, into just a half an hour runtime, and it really wasn't working. Overall, the story felt like it was this rush version of a retelling, a rehash of Captain America the First Avenger. And therein lies the second issue, the fact that there wasn't enough of a difference, enough of a divergence from the original story in my opinion. I felt like the introduction of Captain Carter was great and I really enjoyed the character, but I wished that the introduction of the character in this version of events introduced more differences and more divergences from the original uh, Captain America the First Avenger movie movie and I even suggested perhaps even we would get a Winter Soldier Steve Rogers like we could be really creative with this and I felt like there were a few missed opportunities when it came to the first episode. I say all of this to say that none of these issues are present for episode two. None of these issues oh they're automatically remedied wow <laughs> it's almost as if they consulted me in between the episodes being released because I am telling you episode two is a marked improvement from episode one and I liked episode one don't get me wrong I had a fun time with it but I loved episode two we're going to be delving into all of my thoughts feelings emotions there were a lot of emotions involved with this particular episode as to be expected and also some references some really fun and interesting important references that this episode makes to the MCU as a whole not just to one film as opposed to what happened in episode one of what if where it made a lot of references to a particular film that of course being Captain America the first Avenger. So first of all before we delve into the specificities of this episode we need to take a look at the central question because yes each week we will be focusing on a central question at hand starting of course with what if and this time around the question is what if T'Challa had become Star-Lord instead of Peter Quill? What if Yondu and his ravages had picked up a young T'Challa in 1988 in Wakanda as opposed to picking up uh, Peter Quill in Missouri of the same year. Well as I alluded to earlier it turns out that a lot of things would have changed <laughs> in the MCU if this had actually happened because we see a huge divergence from the series of events that play out in the MCU proper but first of all I wanted to delve into the character of T'Challa himself. Now this was of course a very bittersweet appearance from this character after the tragic passing of Chadwick Boseman last year and I already said when I was reacting to the trailer for what if that this was going to be a tearful episode I was gonna have to grab some tissues I was gonna have to get prepared because I already knew the emotions would be running high but I have to say overall whilst I had expected to be just crying the whole time out of sadness okay because of this tragedy I actually found myself feeling so warm and so happy to see this series of events play out because of how beautifully the character of T'Challa was portrayed in this episode. We're going to be delving into the character from two angles. First of all I want to tackle him as a child because we also see an appearance of child T'Challa in this episode and then we'll talk about him as Star-Lord. First of all the way that this character is animated as a child is so adorable. I loved both iterations of the character and the way that they were animated in this episode. Again, we'll delve into the Star-Lord side of things in a moment, but Kid T'Challa was just 
was so cute. Oh my God, protect him at all costs. <laughs> he was so adorable. And the voice actor as well, like, are you kidding me? But chronologically speaking, when it comes to this character's journey in this episode, we first meet him in Wakanda, where he is speaking to King T'Chaka, who is donning his Black Panther uh, costume, just as he did at the beginning of the Black Panther movie. So again, we're delving into all of these different pockets of the MCU for this episode. But King T'Chaka is trying to explain to his son why he isn't able to explore the world the way that he wishes to. He's telling his son that the world is full of all of these dangers and meanwhile T'Challa is looking out through the palace windows with this awe and this, you know, he has this adventure spirit to him, this explorer spirit as Yondu later on says. And this to me makes perfect sense because when I first saw the what if trailer I wondered how they were going to connect the story of the Guardians of the Galaxy with that of Black Panther I felt like that was a weird mix I didn't quite see you know why you would have uh, a T'Challa version of Star-Lord as opposed to like Nebula or or someone else in the Guardians of the Galaxy corner but this line of reasoning that they introduced in the episode was just so genius to me because at the end of the day all of these comics mumbo jumbo don't actually make sense <laughs> like they're just nonsense at the end of the day but this line of reasoning made it make sense because they created this story for T'Challa where he is this adventurer he does crave adventure and being able to explore beyond the walls beyond the bubble of Wakanda but his father discourages him from doing so and then the one moment where he's able to step out because he throws his spear beyond the walls of Wakanda he ends up getting captured by Yondu's Ravager men. They end up picking him up and taking him on this crazy journey through the galaxy. And that to me is just such clever writing. The way that they were able to link these two very different properties together to create the character of T'Challa Star-Lord and make it make sense and actually be a story that you're invested in and that you actually believe in was just such an incredible feat. Once T'Challa is abducted by the Ravagers, they end up taking him on the ship where Yondu finally meets him and he turns around and he takes one look at this black boy and he's like that's not the kid I sent you to get <laughs> like he's like what's going on he doesn't look like him and he has this holographic image of Peter Quill he's like where's the connection where's the relation and the other ravages are just like I don't know all humans look the same <laughs> which is kind of a play on the saying that like you know all black people look the same so I felt like it was a nice twist on that racist remark but it turns out the reason why the ravagers were so drawn to Wakanda in the first place is because of course Wakanda was built upon this uh, meteorite of vibranium that came from outer space and so when they detected you know all of the regions of earth they found that this specific region felt like it was otherworldly and they were uh, drawn to investigating there as opposed to going to Missouri to find Peter Quill. But in the end Yondu takes a liking to young T'Challa and of of course he does because he's adorable <laughs> he's the best thing ever I love Kid T'Challa so so much then they end up traveling the cosmos on these crazy wild adventures that happen off screen <laughs> they have them completely off screen but the first time that we are visually introduced to this character in the episode is actually later on in his life when he is already Star Lord T'Challa and we see him being introduced in a very similar scene to the one that we are introduced to Peter Quill in the first Guardians of the Galaxy film. Except you can automatically notice some key differences in this version of Star-Lord because of his different attire, because of his different look. Instead of wearing Peter Quill's iconic uh, helmet with the glowing red eyes, his have uh, purple eyes and he is wearing a purple jacket as opposed to Peter Quill's iconic red jacket that was actually the inspiration of Raya's look from Raya and the Last Dragon. I absolutely adored, I absolutely loved the fact that they incorporated the iconic Black Panther colour scheme of purple and gold, okay, which I'm trying to emulate today for you guys. They incorporated that colour scheme as a part of this version of Star-Lord, again mixing together these different pockets of the Marvel Cinematic Universe to create this new unique version of the character. Speaking of mixing together elements from these unique properties 
within the MCU. Just running throughout this episode, I did notice that they also incorporated the scores of each of the respective properties with the music um, from Ludwig Göransson <laughs> in Black Panther. And of course, the score in the first Guardians of the Galaxy film, which to me is one of the most memorable scores of the whole lot. Now, another key difference when it comes to the introduction of this version of Star-Lord is the way that he is treated by others because the scene does play out in a very similar way uh, to the scene that we got in the beginning of the first Guardians of the Galaxy film where Star-Lord is trying to get the orb that houses the power stone. But instead of being met by Ronan's men and him having to introduce himself as Star-Lord to strike fear into their hearts before a fight commences, here we have a completely different scene play out where we do see Ronan's men led by Korath who here is voiced by Digimon Honsu who also portrayed the character in live action in the first Guardians film. This time around instead of T'Challa having to introduce himself as Star-Lord it seems as though Korath is already quite aware of him <laughs> because his reputation precedes him but in a very positive way. He is known as the kind of Robin Hood of the galaxy stealing from the rich and powerful and giving to the poor and powerless. And so here instead of Korath saying his iconic who line <laughs> to Star-Lord. He's the one to actually point out who Star-Lord is. Meanwhile T'Challa is so much more humble <laughs> and he doesn't even claim the title of Lord. He says you know it's not even an official title though of course his official title is that of Prince but anyways <laughs> that's besides the point. He doesn't even claim the titles. He doesn't even you know want to feed off of the fame. He's just so much more humble and just in this moment you can see the difference. You can see the difference in these two versions of Star-Lord who understand that this character has so much more humility to him. He has this strong moral compass of what's right and wrong and even though he's going about things in a you know morally grey way in terms of stealing objects in order to help the impoverished and the suffering, in the eyes of many in the galaxy his ends definitely justify the means and so he's able to amass a huge following, a huge amount of respect and honestly reverence. And the way that this character is portrayed as being just so much more endearing, just so likeable, radiating these this good energy about him. I feel like this speaks volumes to the character of T'Challa, first of all in the MCU and of course Chadwick Boseman um, himself and his legacy within the MCU and within the film industry as a whole and the way that people speak about him. Just all of those things coming together to give us this genuinely good, fundamentally good, character that was just such a joy to watch throughout the entirety I mean he was just and actually I'm so curious <laughs> I'm so curious if Chris Pratt like happened to stumble across this episode was just watching it with his kids I don't know and he was just like hmm <laughs> Like, what are they doing to my version of Star-Lord? Because I'm so sorry, T'Challa's version of Star-Lord makes Peter Quill look so bad. <laughs> it's already on people's bad books because of what happened in Infinity War, but I don't know, like after seeing this, I would be sweating underneath my collar if I were Chris Pratt. And I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Do you prefer T'Challa's version of Star-Lord or do you prefer Peter Quill? Or perhaps you like both of them just the same? <laughs> or perhaps you like neither? No, that's not allowed. <laughs> now the portrayal of this version of Star-Lord being so fundamentally good kind of plays into this overarching theme throughout the episode of just one good person, this one human being with good intentions, being able to have such a great positive impact on the entirety of the galaxy. We see this again through this first opening scene with characters like Korath just kind of bowing down to him and by the way that was a nice nod to the scene in Avengers Infinity War where the Avengers came to Wakanda and Bruce Banner didn't know whether or not to bow to T'Challa. But this reverence follows the character of T'Challa throughout the episode Episode and you see in the way that people speak about him, the way they talk about his past exploits and how it saved a bunch of people. We see how his actions had a great positive impact throughout the galaxy, touching the lives of characters that we know from the MCU, <laughs> including of course Drax, okay, who makes an appearance here, not voiced by Dave Bautista, okay, infamously, but he does make a, an appearance in this episode. When he sees T'Challa, he asks for a selfie that he wants to send to 
to his wife and daughter and of course his wife and daughter died in the original series of events um, by the hands of Thanos and speaking of the devil you have the appearance of Thanos himself who is voiced by Josh Brolin here but just in a completely different vocal performance because this is a completely different version of the character Thanos is nice <laughs> Thanos is not listen all Thanos needed was a quick chat with T'Challa and like all of his issues went away now that's not to say that he's still not lamenting about the the positives of his plan okay of his original plan of genocide that's not to say that he's forgotten all about it he's still saying that it was a viable option in terms of its efficiency but T'Challa talked him out of it okay they had a nice conversation he took him out of it and now he's actually on T'Challa's side now he's fighting on the side of the ravagers because he sees the impact that this one person has been able to have throughout the galaxies and he sees that he didn't have to go down that dark path anymore because there was another way and again in large contrast to what we saw in episode one of the series this episode really leaned into showing the impact of the butterfly effect in full force and along with Thanos we're also introduced to one of his daughters in Nebula except Nebula has a different look <laughs> Nebula has a different look for this episode because again one of the effects of Thanos not becoming the mad titan that he does become in the Avengers films is that he wasn't pitting Nebula and Gamora against one another and forcing Nebula to you know take on these robotic parts every time that she lost kind of updating her in this incredibly inhumane way so she managed to retain a lot of her organic material <laughs> she managed to maintain a lot of her actual body and she also has a lovely head of hair <laughs> a lovely head of blonde hair listen I personally feel like she should have been a redhead okay I feel like the coloring would have worked better for her blue skin if she had had like orangey hair because of course blue and orange are contrasting colors but I also feel like the yellow was just so jarring on the blonde hair <laughs> it was just so jarring in comparison to like the darkness especially because the episode as a whole is quite dark so the hair is very striking which I'm sure was the intention but I feel like it would have been just as striking to see Nebula with red hair instead of the blonde and it would have been a nice ode to the character who portrays her in live action and I believe voiced her in this episode Karen Gillan. Now it's with the help of Nebula and the Ravagers and everyone else that T'Challa is able to assemble a team to get the embers of something <laughs> to get the MacGuffin of this week's episode okay it's like an ember that brings life to like dead planets so T'Challa really wants to get his his hands on this embers or something but he would need to visit nowhere where the collector lives and we of course know the collector as he was portrayed by Benicio del Toro in the first Guardians of the Galaxy film and Benicio does return to voice the character here but here the collector has undergone quite a transformation the collector is built <laughs> the collector is dense as hell okay he is not messing around he is not the weakling the kind of weirdo <laughs> that we found in the the first uh, Guardians of the Galaxy film and in Infinity War as well like he is a very powerful character and I wonder if it's because he didn't have to go up against Thanos and his crazy rule so maybe that's why his power has increased and his influence has increased because Thanos isn't a thing like he isn't a, a viable threat because he's gone down this different path like I wonder if that's what they're suggesting because that would be very clever and again another example of the butter fly effect from this key decision that is explored in the central focus of the episode nonetheless the collector has been collecting okay <laughs> he's been doing what he does best and that is collecting items from all across the cosmos and mostly sentient beings that he is locking up in these cages we see some dark elves we see a dog which is supposed to be an ode to the um dog that ended up being sent off to space by the ussr we saw that dog i believe in the first guardians of the galaxy film as well and we also of course get the cameo from Howard the Duck once again like he's just chilling in there <laughs> and T'Challa ends up releasing Howard so that he can guide him through the maze that is the collector's collection <laughs> the collector's exhibition if you will but T'Challa and Nebula and the rest of the Ravagers end up devising this plan to gain access to the embers of whatever it is <laughs> before they can get anywhere near the collector they have to go through the Black Order which is yes the kind of bodyguards that Thanos has in Avengers Infinity War and so it's fitting then that Thanos is the one to warn the Ravagers that these people mean business 
and during this whole mission that plays out we do get some fun little tidbits throughout these scenes for example we get to see Thanos fighting on the good side which is crazy and there was that point where he had to go up against a black dwarf and you do hear him say you know I'm not crazy I'm mad of course paying homage to his title as the mad titan and we got to see T'Challa and Yondu fighting alongside each other against the incredibly dench <laughs> okay incredibly hench and dench collector and the collector has not just been a uh, collecting sentient beings because it turns out he's also gotten his hands on some very powerful weapons including Captain America's shield I want to know the story there he even has Thor's hammer and he even has Hela's kind of headpiece the kind of moving headpiece that she has in Thor Ragnarok and I just found it so hilarious <laughs> I found it so honestly truly mwah, magnificent they actually animated the collector putting on the headpiece in a very similar way to the way that Kate Planchette's Hela put on the headpiece in Thor Ragnarok the way he did the like that was incredible <laughs> so yeah I would say that whilst the mission overall wasn't the most interesting part of the actual journey and the actual story here it was a good kind of motivator for all of these characters to come together and for us to be able to see these characters fighting on the same team like that is just amazing like where else would you see this nowhere <laughs> well nowhere but also nowhere in the MCU <laughs> alongside the theme of one person being able to make a huge difference across galaxies there's also this other theme of this kind of father-son relationship between Yondu and T'Challa and that's very much mirrored by the relationship that Yondu has with Peter Quill in the films anyway but here it takes on a different meaning because T'Challa's family is still alive in Wakanda but it turns out that Yondu lied to him preventing T'Challa from ever trying to seek out his family on earth and that creates a huge point of contention between the two especially when T'Challa finds one of the Wakandan ships sent out to find him as part of the collector's collection and he sees the message that his father left behind you know seeking out his son and telling his son that he is the brightest star in the galaxy like woo woo like who's cutting onions in here <laughs> like truly this episode was trying to make me cry this episode was trying his darndest to make me cry okay but once T'Challa sees that he loses all trust in Yondu because he had lied to him and so they do have that point of contention there that again very much mirrors what we see between the live action uh, Peter Quill and Yondu in the film in the end this is resolved and T'Challa comes to terms with the fact that he does see Yondu as a second father to him and he's even able to introduce Yondu to King T'Chaka and again like someone's trying to make me cry someone is cutting up onions in here right underneath my my cheek trying to make me cry because the moment that Yondu met King T'Chaka in Wakanda and they had that party Thanos was there Thanos was invited to the party still talking about his awful genocidal plan <laughs> but the moment that they were able to meet these two father figures in to Charla's lies like that was just so beautiful that was just so heartwarming like it just meant the world honestly and sure like if I was to Chaka I'd be like you kidnapped my son though <laughs> if I was to Chaka I'd be asking more questions and a bit more of an aggressive tone if I were him but the moment was just so beautiful I'm glad that they didn't ruin it <laughs> and finally just as we think that this episode is going to end on this beautiful magical moment the scene of camaraderie and family and love and celebration no <laughs> we cut to a dairy queen presumably in the middle of Missouri somewhere where we see an adult Peter Quill mopping up the floor only to be interrupted by Eco <laughs> his father oh god fatherhood is of course a very important theme throughout this episode but this time around we see a very different type of father figure we ultimately know from the events of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 that Ego is out to consume Peter Quill okay he wants to feed off of his life force and so whatever happens between the two 
you is going to end poorly as of course is said by the watcher himself who continues to be this omnipresent but non-interfering yet <laughs> non-interfering character within these episodes and by the way I love the way that they incorporate the watcher in some of these scenes where you just see an outline of him and his like beaming eyes like just in the skies or in the planets it's just a very beautiful way of reminding us that this character is constantly watching but that's it from me now that I told you guys my thoughts on episode two of what if it's time for you guys to let me know what you thought of this episode down in the comments below please be sure to subscribe to catch you videos coming up thank you guys so so much for watching I really really appreciate it and I will see you in the next one bye